Hi, this is Kate Blunt. Um, we had expected Bill Boldick to um, join us to give us a uh, an introduction, uh, but he's having some difficulties, so uh, he's asked that we proceed so we don't hold everybody up. Um, so welcome to everybody. Uh, we have some uh, this is our last uh, of five webinars um, that we held this month and last month to share best practices um, about the topics that were covered in the ACSI survey. Um, if you missed any of the other webinars, you know you can find those recording in the slides on the NASCAST site. Um, hey, Kate? Yeah. Bill, I, I was able to uh, to get in. Oh, well, I'm going to turn it over to you then. We're on the slide two. You can present all the presenters and and do your stuff. Thanks, Bill. All right, great. Uh, thanks, Kate. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, as Kate said, this is a final of this series of the five webinars held this month, and the last to share the best practices from this about the topic covered in the ACS on the state accountability measures. So if you have any of the others, you can find the recording and slides on the NASCAP website. Thank um, uh, NASCAP, um, in particular, uh, Kate Blunt, Jack Moore, uh, for the effort in taking up the opportunity Provided by the ACSI survey and putting together the best group webinar series. And I thank all the presenters today. Um, and uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, we have uh, Suki uh, Montez in California. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, Doug Williams from Kansas, uh, the CSCZ program manager there. Kathy Skoland. From Dakota, Program Specialist, Catherine in Wisconsin, um, the CSBG Contract Manager there, Jackie, of course, uh, from NASCAP, and then Kate Blunt. Okay, slide. So, the goal of, for this webinar is to provide best practices about how state CSBG lead agencies distribute funds and use discretionary funds, particularly in regard to addition of funds, make sure there's no interruption of services delivered to clients, and the quality of the state's processes for executing an award, and the use of discretionary funds in transparency of how funds were used and distributed, and responsiveness to network needs. So, um, both distribution of funds and discretionary funds are two key areas. The ACSI provides us with a lot of information at local agencies view the efficiency, effectiveness, and how to distribute funds and discretionary. So OSIS is using the ACSI and the methodology in order to help states focus their improvement efforts. And one way to do this is to identify best practices used by states who score well survey areas. So why should we focus on best practices? To give a spark your imagination is a chance to get out of the, this is a way to do it in our state way of thinking. And um, uh, invented here, not like my state, I see obstacles. So those, uh, those kinds of thinking, what we'll be thinking about is is how I adapt this idea in my state. And we're some really great presenters today on some of the best practices to do just that. Uh, now I'm going to go, I'm going to uh, turn it back over to, I believe, Jackie. Oh, actually, Jackie's not. Um Jackie's on the line today. She uh, caught in a in an airplane. So I'm going to take over at this point. I'm a good pinch hitter for everybody. So this is Kate Blunt. Um, let me walk through the agenda. Let's go to uh, slide four. Uh, I'll give a little bit of what Jackie usually does in terms of talking about the, the best practices work group. Talk a little bit about ACSI and, and continuous improvement. And then turn it over to our presenters from the states about some of the things they do in the state. 
uh, in terms of uh, distribution of funds and how they use discretionary funds. So let's go slide six. So today I mentioned um, distribution of funds and use of discretionary funds. The work group, the purpose of the work group was to share examples, approaches, and strategies used by the state offices, identify best practices in the areas that were covered by the ACSI and are obviously covered in the state accountability measures. The practices work group consisted of 15 people. We're at slide seven. Um, and your list uh, range from California to Wisconsin. And this group was comprised of the states that scored in the top five in at least one of the areas that were surveyed, one of those uh, six areas that I just showed. Um, every state scored in the top five in every area, but if they scored at least in the top five in one area, uh, they were on the work group. Uh, obviously, uh, they scored well. Uh, it's likely that they're doing something that would be worth emulating. Work group started meeting back um, in the summer. And first we met as a full group, and then we put together some subgroups around the various topics. Uh, and then the subgroups were comprised of the states that scored the highest in each of those areas. And they met in various uh, conference calls over the summer uh, and early fall to share examples, approaches, and strategies. And that's what we've put together for um, the webinars and also started this at the NASCAST conference. So that's the process that we um, went through. So let's talk a little bit about the ACSI and um, continuous improvement. Let's glide 10, Muska. So OS is using the ACSI to help it and the states focus their improvement efforts to become more effective in each of the areas surveyed. Um, the focus really is on continuous improvement. Um, and that's less of a concern about what the final scores are. It's more that we show improvement from year to year. So <clears throat> continuous improvement requires, as you all know, measuring where you are by getting some customer feedback. You have to start with um, up in that, that orange circle there. Uh, we're starting with. And the ACSI methodology really gives you a lot of data and comments that can be used to focus change efforts. Our next step of continuous improvement after you know where you're starting from and you get some customer feedback is to make some changes and then measure again. Hopefully today you'll get some ideas about some changes that you could make, um, both in the distribution of funds and the use of discretionary funds. The next survey isn't going to be until 2019, so it gives the states a chance to make some of the changes, to make some improvements that might enhance the scores. Next slide, slide number 11. Let me do this briefly because I imagine a number of you that are on this webinar have already um, heard the previous webinars. Um, but a very good news, the Customer Satisfaction Index uh, went up six points from 2015. Uh, many states took the challenge of continuous improvement quite seriously. 14 states saw a significant increase in their CSI score between 2015 and 2017. And this really is what drove uh, the increase overall in customer, uh, in customer satisfaction. Also saw increases, significant increases in every area that was surveyed. Uh, so let's look at the next slide and look at that specifically. Um, that's slide number 12, Muska. So quick snapshot, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but um, in the blue uh, squares there, which are the areas that were surveyed, those are the areas, um, and you will see the scores on the uh, hand side in the, in the gray circles. All of those scores went up between 2015 and 2017. Um, and you can see uh, in orange squares the impact of these, very similar to what was in 2015. So communication remains the highest impact. Monitoring and corrective action, also very important. Training and technical assistance and then linkages. So the four areas that the states, uh, that we indicate that the states need to more, most focus on in terms of continuous improvement. Uh, 
specifically at the distribution of funds and some data and comments about that. So let's go to slide 14, Muska. Distribution of funds, uh, we saw a four point increase to 72. It's the third highest going driver. So see the states do a pretty good job at this. Um, and both the insurance no interruption and the quality of the process uh, went up a few points um, across the board. However, there was quite a range among the states. Uh, the range was from 15 to 96. So we had some states that obviously um, can use some ideas for how to improve their uh, process for the distribution of funds. Let's watch 15. I'll give everybody a few minutes to or a minute or two to read some of the comments um, about how to improve uh, the grant award process. You will see a lot of these have to do with timing, uh, have to do with kind of the comment about consistency, transparency, timeliness, summarizes it all. Um, please would like a place to be able to see where in the grant award is. There's a lot of duplication of paperwork when there's amendments, and obviously we do a lot of amendments when we're dealing with CRs. So I'll give you a minute to read all of the comments, but I think this gives you a pretty good sense of where the local agencies are coming from. Slide 16. Some of the suggestions that we got from the survey respondents about distribution of funds. Um, and probably the one that stands out is the last one. OCS perhaps assists in the establishment of time with the state to a timely grants award process. So um, trying to um, work some of that out. Uh, development of a more effective and efficient contract system, and then being able to train some new lead agency staff. Sometimes um, there was concern that not everybody knows how to do this. So unless there are any outstanding questions, let me turn this over um, to our three state presenters who, uh, regarding the distribution of funds. We will get to the uh, Youth discretionary funds, uh, the latter part of this presentation or of this webinar. So we're going to have Doug Williams from Kansas, Kathy Skoglin from South Dakota, and Katie Kestern from Wisconsin. So let me turn it over to Doug. You all set, Doug? Hi. Hello, everyone. It's actually Doug Wallace from Kansas. There was a mistake on the slide that I didn't catch before. So uh, I'm Doug Wallace. I am the CSBG program manager in Kansas. Uh, next slide, please. To tell you a bit about Kansas, we have eight community action agencies, which includes seven private and one public entity. Those eight agencies cover or provide services in all 105 counties in Kansas. The CBG funding is used to uh, support 1.99 FTEs. Funding for my position, I am a full-time position, but used to uh, really support mobile staff within Kansas Housing Resources Corporation that provides support to the CSBG program. So that includes staff like my director, um, our full monitor, fiscal staff, administrative assistant, so to again provide support to CSBG. Our CG program is located in Kansas Housing Resources Corporation. We are a subsidiary public corporation of the Kansas Development Finance Authority. And then according to our, our final allocation for FY 2017, Kansas received $5.75 million. Um, it's 5% of that for administrative costs, and then it's up to 5% for discretionary projects. Next up, please. So when I put together my presentation, I um, wanted to talk about to ensure no interruption of services 
or no interruption of funding, and then also to talk about the quality of our process. CANDA has developed a process to ensure our grantees do not experience a delay in funding. What we have set up is um, our CSBG funds, the pass-through funding, is six months after the start of our federal year. So in case our federal year is, is October 1 through September 30. So our eligible entities are awarded funds on a program year that begins April 1st through March 30th. And they're given 18 months to spend their award. So when they set their budgets, they set it on a 12-month program year. But again, they're given 18 months to fully spend their award. So as an example, our FY 2017 funding, we will the CSBG eligible entities Entities, um, the funding on April 1st of 2017, and they have until September 30th of 2018 to fully expend their city funds. Next slide, please. And then to the quality of process. So, you know, Katie created a process to ensure that the eligible entities receive timely payments and accurate payments. And you know, we start by every program year, we provide the each key what we call a grant transaction report, which is an Excel workbook that um, is used to track expenditures and to request payments. The, for the eligible entity, they submit the GTR on a monthly basis, DRC, and that's what they're using to report monthly expenditures and to request their pay payment. The uh, GTRs are formatted so that they auto-calculate um, expenditures, total expenditures, remaining funds, just a number of different areas are auto-calculated. So they can be used by the grantee and also by KHRC to track expenses and to just track uh, payments. Next slide, please. Also built in quality checks to ensure that we have accurate payments. So when the grantees submit their GTRs to KC, and they're expected to submit those GTRs by the 15th of the month to ensure that they receive a timely payment. The GTRs are, are submitted to me and then I review each of them to ensure that they're completed, they're, um, they be accurate. I confirm with our information that I have within KHRC if there are questions or um, issues, I go to the grantee and we, we make sure that the, the GTR is accurate. Yeah, please. Once with my review, that information to my director, and um, my director will review it to make sure everything looks accurate, and then we'll forward that information to our administrative assistant, who will make the federal draw. Within uh, once we make that federal draw, we forward the information to our fiscal department. Within a day of our fiscal department receiving the approved payment request, the fund entered as an electronic transfer and are posted and available the following day. So with them receiving the payment request, they're putting the funds, making them available. And then KHRC, the accounting software system, gives an email that lets the CSBG eligible entity know that the transaction has been processed. So while it seems like a lot of steps, it's a very efficient process that within normally within about seven to ten days following the submission of the GTR, we're able to post that payment and make the funds available. And next slide, please. So I just want to finish by sharing some of the comments that were found on the 2015 ACSI survey that the report given to Kansas. So I just copied the verbatim comments from the survey. 
Um, our mentees, they believe it's working. Um, what is it? I think we have a good process. The system now in place works extremely well for us. And those that stagger the grant start date a few months back from the federal fiscal year seem to experience fewer delay difficulties. So no, no, I think our eligible entities, they like the process we have set up. They, um, they were able to get their funding timely. And again, we, we have multiple checks in place to make sure that the payments are accurate. That, thank Thanks, Doug, and our apologies for getting your name wrong. Good heavens, how, how did that happen? I have no idea. Um, but hopefully we have everybody else's name straight. So uh, we're having Kathy from South Dakota speak next. And it occurs to me that after Kathy speaks and after Katie speaks, uh, then we'll open it up for some questions just about distribution of funds, and then we'll go to the um, use of discretionary funds. Kathy, you ready to go? Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Excellent. All right, next slide, please. I work in South Dakota. We have four community action agencies. They're, they're large agencies of anywhere from um, 14 to 20 counties. <clears throat> I am the only staff person who works with the program. My supervisor, of course, monitors my, my performance, but um, I work about half time in this program. I office in Sioux Falls, a state office uh, state capital is Pier, and that's 227 miles away, which is sometimes benefit, sometimes not. <laughs> um, within the Department of Social Services, within the Division of Economic Assistance, minimum funded state, we received $2.97 last year. We use up to 5% for administration. Typically, we don't use that much, and the funds are distributed right back to the agencies at the same percentage. All other funds are given to them. We use 5% for or for discretionary, and we um, specify uh, that those funds must be used for emergency services. That's not particularly popular with two of the four agencies, um, but DSS administration feels very strongly that that is um, a necessity. <clears throat> Next slide, please. We use a document called a financial status report that sounds somewhat similar to what Doug was just We've used this form for approximately 10 years with, with some tweaks. It's an Excel-based form. Uh, we provided training on it. We provide training whenever there's any kind of a change. We have provided written direction, and we feel that that consistency has been helpful with the agencies knowing how to do it and, and what expectations to have of it. It, each line item on the Excel format represents um, a, an approved funding stream. So they submit a, a um, plan of care or plan, annual plan to me, and they break it down um, on the uh, financial status report. Next slide, please. <coughs> it, <coughs> pardon me. Next, anytime there's a variance of more than 10% of the budget on one of those line items, they need to do uh, an amendment. And we do provide a, a single page form for that that, um, make that that approval can be made. They can submit requests for payments. Uh, we, we ask no less than monthly by the 25th of the month, but they do them semi-monthly if they wish to. The form uh, collects. Um, the amount that they are wanting to draw in a particular area, it shows the budget for that area, it shows the current expenditures and the total expenditures for that um, line item, and any funds remaining in that category. And the state re re does reserve the right to modify the request. Um, we are pretty strict about the amount of cash that they can have on hand. And um, so we do sometimes modify those down. Next slide. <clears throat> we do them to draw for the next three days in, in line. And then the next is if they have a significant expenditure and they know what that expenditure cost is going to be, they can include that. So it can be up to 45 days um, advance um, if it's reasonable and necessary. 
last six weeks of the contract year, we go reimbursement only, and agents may re agencies may request up to weekly if they need to um, to get those reimbursements to keep their cash flow. Give them notice two to three weeks advance that we're when we are shifting to reimbursement so that they know that that's going to be happening. Next slide, please. Uh, they submit electronically to me. I um, review it, approve it, submit it electronically to my supervisor and to the Office of Provider Reimbursement. Um, that my supervisor doesn't take any action unless she sees a problem with it. Um, the, it goes from provider reimbursement to accounts payable to the auditor's office where the checks are generated and usually takes in the neighborhood of two weeks, sometimes a little less, but we ask them to um, allow us two weeks. And the couple of things that the agencies like is that they monitor the progress of their requests for payments electronically and are paid electronically. Sorry, please move on. Those two points are in the next slide. <clears throat> and I appreciate being able to, to know where they are in the process. Next slide, please. The only delays would be if I'm on leave, and I always notify the agencies if I'm going to be gone more than one day, um, so that they can they can plan when to submit a request for payment. Um, a budget amendment sometimes that process can take um, a few extra days uh, to when there are questions about why that that change needs to be made that greater than. 10% budget change. And then at the very end and the very beginning of fiscal year, sometimes um, there's a slowdown when all those contracts are being loaded and um, it, it can take an extra week or two to get that payment out right at the beginning. But again, as part of the contract process, I always um, remind the agencies that that's a possibility and that we uh, we're working hard to do that to the greatest extent possible. May I please? is just timely payment is a priority and we know that the agencies need those funds to be able to provide services to the, to the clients and we take that very seriously and so we make uh, payment to them a priority. And that's what I have to share. Thank you. Kathy, that was very helpful. Um, just a reminder to folks, we're, uh, we're going to take questions after the next uh, presenter, which is Katie Kestern from Wisconsin. Um, so, uh, write down your questions. You have a uh, place on the on the website or on the webinar to uh, write in your questions, um, or obviously you can raise your hand. But let me now turn it over to Katie to talk about what they do in Wisconsin. Thanks, Katie. Hi, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Oh, great. So I'm Katie Castron in Wisconsin. Um, next slide, please. So in Wisconsin, we've got 16 community action agencies and two limited purpose agencies that receive CSBG, all private, um, and our staffing is pretty lean. We've got myself, one FTE, and then a small portion of my supervisor um, charge CSBG right now. Um, CSBG is administered by our Department of Children and Families. Within the Division of Family and Economic Security, which operates the state's HANF program, and um, we approximately 8.6 million right now. And then you can see our allocation for admin is oh, pretty lean, and we have about 4% discretionary funds, which are discretionary in Wisconsin all goes straight to 11 federally recognized tribal governments. Um, and it's been for a long time, and it's they were used to get their funds directly through for feds, and then it, it come out through the state as our discretionary dollars. Next, okay. So they um, we distribute our funds for CSBG. We use calendar year contracts. Um, so I do the idea that Kansas bases it even further into their. <laughs> um, that fiscal year because obviously we don't, don't we when we start our calendar year in January one we don't tend to know our, our um, actual allocation amount for that year. 
of CSPG. Um, but we do, for our contracts, we use the, a system called DocuSign, which um, has been really great. It's very streamlined, and it allows for elect electronic signatures on contracts. It's very quick um, and leaves a good record of everybody who touches a contract. Then we use all of our payments are made only by direct deposit. We use online online um, reporting system for expense reports. It is new. That's only been in place since early last year. It's been a great improvement. Previously, we had agencies submit X reports as email attachments to our finance department. And every now and then, our for some reason, our um, system would um, put put it into spam folders or block their emails. Um, so it wasn't ideal. So now we have this online reporting system where they have a web-based format for um, reporting. They have to do that 20th of each month. It's um, If they submit by the 20th of the month, then it will be paid by the end of the month. So we have a pretty pretty good turnaround there on payments. Unfortunately, oh. unfortunately, WebEx has frozen on my end, so for some oh. reason, I'm unable to click slides, which is very convenient. But I can just keep talking. If that's should I just keep talking? I should be the way to go for now until I regain control of this. Okay. Fun. Um, so those um, for for CSPG fund distribution, my next slide, what it says is that the um, AEs report their expenditures just into two broad categories of SPG program expenses or administration. And then the state office, when we when I go out and do um, CSPG monitoring visits, I validate a sample of their expense reports. So I go have look through the general ledger and then back up on a couple months of the previous year. So that's how we make sure um, the expense reports were accurate. Um, okay, and let's keys to agency satisfaction. So we do score high. We have scored very high in fund CSPG fund distribution on the last on the um, both of the ACSI surveys. And I would say the agencies the, the keys to their satisfaction are that they find it it's easy to get their CSPG funds. Um, they know we are flexible. They can submit their reports on a monthly basis, or they can wait and submit their reports less frequently. We up to them how often they want to um, submit expense reports. Um, and our accounting staff are actually pretty forgiving. Uh, if an agency misses that month's expense reporting deadline of the 20th, if somebody's out sick or for some reason they're not able to get it together to put their expense report in on time, um, our finance staff does what they can to get them a payment out anyway. So they're flexible and reasonable about that. Um, let's see, I'm missing anything. Um, all righty. And, um, so I think what they like the most, I think um, the, what they do not like is that, I've gotten feedback on this, but my, the management of my department has said it will not change. Um, in the past, SPG State Office office used to allow advance payments at the beginning of each contract year, but no, um, that was taken away um, due to problems in another program. That, um, so we have a strict reimbursement only policy now. And that was I had to uh, present today. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Katie. Uh, Luda, have you got control yet of the? Working. It still have not been able to regain control yet. Um, well, while, while you're trying to do that, why don't I open it up and uh, see if there's any questions for Kathleen or Katie regarding the distribution of funds and the process they use? Does anybody um, have a question? You can either raise your hand or type it into the uh, the Q&A piece. 
And can you see if anybody's asking any questions? The frozen, I cannot see or click on anything. Okay, well, let me do this, folks. We're gonna we're gonna roll with the punches here. If anybody has a question, can you just unmute yourselves and speak up? Yes, go ahead. Hi, this is Katie from Nebraska, and I just had a question um, for Kansas. Um, just, can you explain a little bit more about how and why um, you don't distribute funds until April, um, and kind of explain that process? Do my best. Yes, the Doug with Kansas. Um, this process actually had been established before I came on board with Kansas Housing Resources Corporation. So this was something that I believe KHRC set up um, with support from the network, or they uh, they had talked to the network network about this. But the report is that um, avoid any delays in funding that you might experience when you're working with federal grants. So the the, the to the eligible entities are made six months after after Kansas receives our um, allocation of funding to any of those those delays that you might experience. So to give give you an example with FY eighteen money, we are uh, the the premium year will begin in April and uh, the agencies will submit a refunding application. They'll set their budget on a twelve month budget, but then as they'll have up to 18 months to expend their funding. So every year there's a, a, a overlap of, of um, we're finishing up one, you know, the previous year's funding as well as beginning to spend next year's funding. I don't know if your question Yeah, you did. Okay. Any questions? Just speak up if you have a question. Unmute yourself. Yes, Cindy Parsons from New York State, and I have a question for Doug. My question for Doug is, um, do you advance your agencies on the 18 month, or how does it, how does the overlap work exactly? We'll do some we do in advance if they submit a, well, again, what we use is the GTR, the Grand Transaction Report. If they submit that and request in advance, they just have in their, in their they email request to me in their email or or on the GTR they need to why they need the advance but we'll do that. Is that question? Thank you. Other questions. Muska, how are we doing on the uh, webinar? Muska? Yeah, we're running between two offices, so we got control of it. Um, so we'll be able to advance through the slides, but it'll just a few more seconds for us to be able to do that. So we can move on to the next slide in just a couple seconds. Oh, we can all be patient, it's all right. Um, so we're gonna start on slide 42. Um, I'm just gonna give a couple of um, information about the use of discretionary funds and how that's scored on the ACSI um, and what some of the comments were. Uh, so where we're going to now is the use of discretionary funds. Let me move and I can move on. Can you hear me, Kate? This is Eric. Yeah. 
Okay. Can you see the correct slide now? Yeah, 42. Can every, I don't know if everybody else can. Yeah. Okay. Should be all good. Take it away. Okay. Thanks so much, Eric. Mm -hmm. I have an advance on my end. This is California. That? No. Okay. So. Oh, we see CBT fund distribution. I just said, I just got a message that hers didn't go either. Hmm. Mine advancing all along. Lisa just said hers is just now advanced. Okay. Is yours advancing? The 40? No, it's not advancing. Thanks, Suki. I'm seeing the CSBG food distribution. Fun, sorry, fun. I'm thinking of food because it's right around the corner for lunch. Um, CSBG fun distribution. Isn't that slide 42 there? That's fine. It should say, yes, the remainder discretionary funds is the side we're on. No, this was the Wisconsin Department. It's Their slide was titled, it was the last one that Kate spoke about, the CSBG distribution. Oh, can you under, do you under the West Wisconsin? It's slide seven. Okay, can do you see numbers at the top of the slides? Can you move yours down? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, I got it. Okay, oh. everybody moves to slide forty two. We'll be all right. So let's go back to forty two. Okay, I'm just going to assume everybody's there. Okay. I think that sometimes this is, can be so difficult and there's glitches, but then I always remember the positive. A few years ago, we could never have done this kind of thing. So this is a way that we share information despite all the glitches. So use of remainder and discretionary funds. Uh, this is the um, area that proved significantly from 2015. It went from 59 to 68, so a nine-point improvement, which is uh, is, is good, um, and particularly regarding the transparency of distribution and the responsiveness to the needs um, of the local agencies. Uh, that was a good thing. Uh, the state, the scores among the states from zero to 100. Uh, this is a little bit um, less informative because some of the zeros had to do with the fact that um, some states don't have discretionary funds or they don't distribute them. So they were, sometimes the local agencies just get zero. Um, so it's exactly reflective. Uh, but it's still, um, it's still a poor area. Interestingly enough, this was, this, this was the area that had the lowest impact of all the other areas, communication, uh, grant training, training and technical assistance, linkages, all had much higher impact. Um, doesn't mean it's not important, but it what I say is that enough states who might try to make some changes here, this won't have a significant impact in their score. Next slide. Here are some of the comments we heard. Um, and pretty reflective of what the scores were. Uh, a lot of had to do, and I'll give you a minute or so to read these, but all of them had to do with transparency, including the local agencies in determining how to distribute the money, um, having a collaborative process, include tribes. So I'll let you read these uh, and you'll see where um, some of the local agencies are coming from. evident that what local agencies are saying is they want to know what was the criteria for who got what, 
how much everybody got, what was what was decision making process selected, how were the funds eventually used, what impact those have had, et cetera, et cetera. Um, not terribly surprising, but I thought thoughtful comments. Next slide. Here were suggestions that respondents made, and I think the key one, uh, the key things to look at. Um, I see some examples of what other states are using, and we have a couple of speakers who will speak to that. Uh, and then the final, you know, good transparency regarding the process, the use of the discretionary funds, and then best practices for using those funds. Um, those are some of the suggestions. Be able to make sure we have enough time for um, our next two speakers, who are um, from California. Suki and Katie again from Wisconsin. So, Suki, are you ready to go? Sure, I am. Thank you. Okay, it's yours. Um, well, again, my name is Suki Montes from California. I also have my partner in crime here, Leslie Taylor, um, who is the manager over the uh, field operations unit, our computer unit. That will be chiming in as well. A little bit about California. Uh, California, of course, is a large NC, and we have an extremely diverse population. Um, we have 58 community action agencies that provide an array of services based on their findings of needs assessment, which is conducted every two years. Um, also, within those 15, 50 agencies, we have two limited purpose agencies um, that are actually paid for discretionary funding, which I will talk about um, a little bit later. And um, within the 58 agencies as well, we have um, four farm worker um, agencies that are providing services and targeting um, the farm worker population, and three agencies that are providing um, services to Native Americans. Um, right now for CSBG, we have 15 full staff that are providing um, direct services. Um, we have three units in our division. Um, one is the program development unit, the unit that I manage, and we have um, a newly created unit, which is our training and technical assistance unit, and um, the field operations unit. And and just to put you, give you a little bit of perspective of the 50 agencies, because we have LPAs, or 60, we have our monitors, which are four, they're monitoring, um, they're assigned to 50 agencies um, each. This is also, um, Suki, to chime in here. Um, when we talk about the breakdown of our community action agencies, about half of them are public, and the other half are private nonprofit organizations. Um, yes, thank you. The Department of Community Services Development is housed under the Health and Human Services. Uh, I'd also like to mention that um, as a state agency, we are also are fortunate enough to receive um, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program and the Department of Energy funding. This certainly is very beneficial uh, for us because we really collaborate very closely with our energy pro partners. Uh, particularly in the monitoring area, we want to make sure many of our agencies are um, dual funder. We receive um, both CG and LIHEAP. So we, where possible, we try to um, provide a consistent monitoring. Let's see, for um, the grant, um, we generally receive about $62.9 million. 90% of that um, is distributed to our community action agency. Of that 92%, we set aside 10% um, goes to the migrant seasonal farm workers, and about 3.9 um, is distributed to a Native American Indian um, organization, which totals 80%. We also have set aside 5% for administration, and 5% is available for discretionary funding, which is approximately $3.1 million. Next slide, please. 
okay, do this manually here. Um, here on your slide, um, identifies the various uses of our discretionary funding. Um, let me begin um, with the limited purpose agencies. Um, these are sole purpose agencies, and um, they're very they're providing very specific services. One of our agencies. Uh, concentrates their services in community development, uh, for example, improving drinking water, working safe and affordable housing initiatives. We also have the Community Design Center that works with um, various build structures uh, uh, with the build regulations and codes. Also, um, as you know, nationally, CSB has been reduced, so we do um, that happens, our director has opted to backfill some of the losses um, from the discretionary funding. And, and this, of course, is a collaborative with our network. Um, at the beginning, we're very transparent, and we, at, we give them choices as far as these are the different things that we can do. And, of course, for the last two years or three years, they have opted um, to utilize some of the discretionary funding to backfill. We also have um, the disaster funding, and approximately we sh we put aside in a pot, and in, in the event of a disaster, approximately two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. Of course, this is a drop in the bucket, so uh, there is an application process for our NCs to request this funding in the event in a disaster. We're really looking at for the agencies that are leveraging because we that this is such a small amount of funding that uh, will be available. Um, over the years, we have had uh, our number, a share of disaster funding, beginning with the fires, and then we've had floods, and most recently for the past two or three years, California has been involved um, with, um, drought, with the drought. So annual, uh, annually, uh, CSD, sets aside a portion of the funds for training and technical assistance. Where I will be concentrating my presentation on uh, in that area, as well as in the targeted initiative and innovative projects. Next slide, please. I'm able to manually move forward. Can someone move the slide? We stuck again. We're on slide 50. Which slide would you like? I'm, I'm I, yeah, 50. I can't advance it on my end. I'm still 49. So I've advanced it, and everybody should be seeing slide 50. Okay, I guess I'm not able. That's, I don't know what's going on, but I, oh, where'd it go? There we go. It was stuck. Uh, that this is for training and technical um, assistance. Um, as mentioned, since we have a very diverse network of CAAs, um, many of our CAAs are providing services in the rural, urban, focusing on farm workers or Native Americans. So it's really important to understand um, the short, short and long-term needs of the network. Um, we um, are very strategic in um, releasing a survey to ensure that um, we identify those needs, but it's not just sim a, a simply the survey. Um, all, we work very closely with our field operations team. Um, this staff is working, um, sometimes communicating with our agencies on a daily basis. This is our way of also obtaining information, whether it be through their results of their monitoring visits or their their day-to-day -day contact. Uh, so engaging our staff is really fundamental in ensuring that we can put a solid training plan together. Um, under the short-term needs, for example, the organizational standards, um, um, we are moving forward to ensure that we provide the training, proper training to our agencies. Many of our agencies were in various stages. We kind of took those organization uh, standards and identified those that had a short-term um, result. 
involved. So for example, the conflicts of interest, some of the agencies didn't have a simple conflict of interest. We went ahead and made sure we dealt with that. Um, moving to the board minutes, um, the board minutes that are submitted here at CSD, we understand that um, many of the organization standards can be um, met through the board minutes. So providing training to our network to ensure that they're including that critical data in their board minutes is, is very important. Um, so that way we can satisfy those short-term, um, those long-term needs are, would be, the, for example, the strategic plan, which of our 50 agencies were in various stages. Some of them had not even started a strategic plan. Some of them had a, a solid strategic plan. So it's really understanding that um, in detail the their training needs. We also have a um, awesome and strong partnership with our state association, the California Community Action Partnership. Um, they also, of course, are engaging, um, they network and working with um, CSD very closely. We have in person meetings on a monthly basis. We're providing them information on. Um, some of those details that the agency, because um, every agency is at different stages. So, for example, as mentioned, the board, board vacancies, I'm sure everybody's experienced them nationwide. Some of our agencies need very specific training on um, retention of board members, where some of them need um, experience in recruitment of members. So we're working with our association to be very strategic and offering customized training um, to our network. On, and then, of course, we have the general training, which is our board um, training roles and responsibilities. Um, um, roles and responsibilities. Thank you, Leslie. Um, as far as the strategic um, planning, that has been a very high demand and really, really have utilized our network. Um, we recently conducted our very first results oriented management and accountability implementers training. Uh, we had 20 agencies that participated and are uh, become nationally certified. We also have um, three staff here at CSD that are Roma training trainings as well. We hope to have the remaining 40 agencies um, also go through the implementation implementers training this uh, spring. All as part of linking to our department on our strategic plan. Before you move on, I just sure. wanted to add. So with our state association, when it comes to training and technical assistance and the use of discretionary funds, we set aside part of our, 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 our discretionary dollars specific for training and um, technical assistance, and we our state association to do part of that. So some of the trainings that Suki just talked about are through funds that we give directly to our state association who then provides free charge to our network these um, training specific to board vacancies or strategic planning. Um, also our state association based on the specific needs through some of which may be identified through our monitoring, we'll work with our local agencies to maybe hire a consultant to come in and help do some agency capacity building. Mm -hmm. So um, I just wanted to make sure we tied this back mm -hmm. to our state association, yeah. back to how we use discretionary dollars because we do fund our state association yeah. out of that pot of money. Yeah, thank you, Leslie, and that just reminded me, we also, our state association also has implemented peer-to-peer -peer training. Correct. Uh, so we understand that in our network there are um, a lot of uh, staff that have a lot of experience in different areas. So we make sure that they they have established a bank resources where um, one, one community action agency will go out to another uh, community action agency and provide um, hands-on training. So that has worked fairly well. As you know, as we mentioned, that the consultant could be very costly. We're, you know, we're working, always trying to find ways to effectively deliver strategies with a low cost. So that is a really good strategy, this peer-to-peer -peer, 
um, well, many of our agencies have taken full advantage of this method of um, training. So, so as far as linking um, to the strategic plan, um, we want to make sure that um, we develop a highly skilled network by sponsoring um, different types of training that is included in our department's strategic plan. So it's not just for um, our network, Network, for but also for our staff, um, using utilizing our discretionary funding, we were able to bring out NASCAP here to provide um, training on modules two to four. So that, that's been um, very helpful. In addition, we've also been able to bring out Wesley to provide training to the network free of cost um, on the uh, new and Yeah. And it, uh, to us, it's really important, uh, and with CalCAPA, that we stay on top of what the national themes and best practices um, are for uh, um, work and for our internal staff. So we're continually doing research, talking to other uh, organizations outside that, our network to identify trainings that will assist our uh, network. So for example, with the strategic plan, with the association, they actually provided hands-on strategic plan when where they did on-site training. But for one of the other agents, one of the agencies or a couple of the agencies didn't want the um, on-site training. Instead, what they wanted is they wanted a workbook, a tool that they can um, use with their staff as they were developing their strategic plan. So we worked very closely with the association, and they actually developed a a workbook for our agencies to utilize. Next slide here. Um, best practices for targeted and innovative projects. Um, this, this category here, of course, is very important here for CSD and for our network. So when the funding is available, um, we do um, want we certainly network to identify topical areas of need because of the diversity in our network. Um, rural and urban may have different types of need. Uh, so we want to make sure that we are looking at what's going on, uh, not just in California, but in uh, the areas that our agency is providing services. Uh, just Two years ago, we issued a NOFA on homelessness and employment and housing issues, but really not looking just um, for services that are already being currently provided by our agencies, really looking for a targeted and an innovative approach. Uh, we want to make sure that they're thinking outside the box. We are very strategic when we are developing our um, proposals. We include in the criteria exactly what we're looking for. Um, and we understand that there are agencies that are excellent grant writers and other agencies that may not have um, those grant writers available. So we really try to um, develop a proposal where it will be a competitive across the board. There is a limited amount of funding um, when we're issuing um, these targeted proposals. So we want to make sure that we um, have all our network have an opportunity to um, to compete in um, these um, opportunities. Also really important, and we've utilized some of our discretionary funding, expanding leases at the state level. So um, we have a strategic plan, and you know, one fundamental um, goal is for us to reduce poverty in California by inducing innovative or targeted approaches. And um, one way that we found is the earn income tax credit. The earn income tax credit is really not housed in any state agency. So our director um, decided to start a state interagency team reducing poverty work group. Uh, that work group is comprised of other departments, such as the Department of Social Services, Department of Public Health. We have the Franchise Task Board, Employment Development Department. 
Um, we have the business oversight, and then we have also nonprofits. We have United Way. We have our, the federal um, agency that oversees the um, volunteer income tax assistance sites, which is the IRS. They are all part of our membership, and Steve here uh, is the lead and leading this work group. We meet here on a monthly basis um, with discretionary funding. We've actually um, sponsored public service announcements. Um, for the third year, we have commissioned a left on the table report. We contracted um, with Fresno State and a researcher, a, profess a professor that has been very in engaged in earning income tax credit. Uh, put together a report that identifies the amount of funding that is left on the table, not just California-wide, not just California-wide. Bit by county, they identify. Did you see Marvin's email? Can getting some About feedback? Can you uh, some background well, feedback? Okay. I mean, so as I, as I mentioned, on the left on the table report, we've commissioned this report for the last three years. It's really a good um, report where um, we've identified by county the amount of funding that has been left on the table for the earning income tax credit, as well as the benefit when family, economic benefit when families begin to, um, to utilize that credit and spend in their community. Um, Real studies, there's numerous studies that show that uh, when families that are eligible claim a federal earn income tax credit, um, it really helps them lift um, their families out of poverty. California was fortunate enough, two years ago, our governor signed into law our very first state earn income tax credit. So now combined with, with both of these uh, credits, our agency, um, families can receive up to $6,000 in credit. So as a result of our work and our um, initiatives that we funded our discretionary funds, CST was fortunate to receive um, $2 million um, to issue a competitive grant for to increase outreach and awareness in California. And that all started as a result of our um, district funds and um, how we utilize that funding. So as, you know, and as far as nationwide themes and best practices, we do have fortunate enough that we have a team here that really keeps up to date with nationwide themes and best practices. And we're really looking at future um, proposals for discretionary funding, looking for evidence-based programs. We're looking at the generational approach to hopefully um, make some funds available for, I, for our agencies um, to um, be administering a two-generational approach. Okay, this is Kate. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Hi, um, Kate. I need to I need to ask you to wrap up, so because uh, we have one more speaker left, and we only have uh, about uh, 15 minutes. If you could do that, I'd appreciate it. Oh, sure, no problem. No problem. So let me um, let me get to the um, yeah. Let me just get to the challenges. I'm going to go straight to um, slide 53. I think that um, with that said. Um, you know, there are challenges when we're trying to come up with a, uh, a strategic training and technical assistance plan. It's balancing those needs from risk at risk at risk agencies to thriving agencies. Because of course, um, we really want to make sure we get that training to those agencies that are struggling in certain areas that may be at risk. But really, the thriving agencies is where um, we can, if we put more training there, we can utilize them to be an example for our other agencies. So we're always trying to balance the training and technical assistance dollars there. As far as our innovative projects, timing is still, unfortunately, sometimes we don't know how much our final grant will be, so we're not able to distribute the additional funding until late spring, and we're always challenged and with timelines, making sure that we're able to issue this proposal and get these contracts executed as soon as possible. 
Another one is sustainability issues. That's incorporated into our proposals. We want to make sure that we fund proposals that are targeted, innovative, but that can sustain beyond the contract term. And diversity in awardees, we're always making sure that we're, uh, we're issuing uh, proposals across the board and not always to the same, to the same um, commission agencies. And uh, wrapping it up, we're cognizant that we want to make sure that CSBG is our core funding, that the, with our CSBG contract, we want to make sure that we're using similar monitoring um, and corrective action under our um, initiatives and innovative project contract. So, so with that, I'm, I'm, if I'd be glad to answer any questions at the end of this um, session. Great, Suki, that was very thorough. Really, really appreciate it. Let me now back over to Katie from uh, Wisconsin, Katie Kestern. Katie, you, you ready? Is Katie with us? Wait, is Katie on the phone? Or has she been dropped off? I don't see her in the list. At Murphy's Law has taken over this. When <laughs> we have had as many problems as any other one, so I don't know what happened to Katie. Katie, are you on the attendee list? Oh, well, let's um, look at, let's, I'm not sure we can speak to her. Well, let's just go through her slides quickly. Uh, I have heard her present this as she comes back on. Um, she so look at saying, Kate is saying she has to go. So she okay. has given us permission to move on with her slides. And if anybody has questions, we can forward them to her. Okay, so let's just do that. Let's go to slide 55. Uh, so two uses for CSBG discretionary funds in Wisconsin. 0.9% uh, of the total funds, which is nearly 100,000, goes to the Wisconsin Community Action Program Association to support quarterly meetings and for TNTA for the eligible entity. So this was um, similar to what we've also heard, but they use some of the money. I mean, they obviously use a big chunk of the money for their Community Action Association. Next slide. Then they use 4% of the total funds, which is um, $326,000 go to the uh, Indian tribe, R11 in Wisconsin. Um, and be used for a wide range of human services, and each tribe has the flexibility uh, to use whatever services that meet the needs of the community. So they're really focusing on some of the Indian, uh, Indian tribes in Wisconsin. Next. Oops, I missed here. So slide 57 we're on. Um, under, because there's obviously discretionary funds are going to the association and to, to the tribe. Wisconsin has worked with their eligible entities. They've consulted, um, and this has basically been agreed upon that this approach is uh, what they will continue to do in fiscal years 2018 and 2019. So that's something that the state's in a vacuum. Um, so this is how that's proceeded. Okay, I think that's, is that the last slide? Yes. So before we open it up to questions, and I know we don't have as much time as we might like, but um, the today, Doug and, and Kathy and Katie and Zuki all um, are available. Uh, to answer any specific questions or to get some more specific information that you all might want. So we've given you their email addresses and their phone numbers, so please feel free to reach out to them. Uh, and if you have any questions about the ACSI or any information your state has gotten in terms of the data, uh, feel free to give, uh, to give me a call or to um, email me. I'm at kateblunt at you.com. So we'll now open it up for questions. Just mute yourself and ask the question. Lisa, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, 
Uh, um, this question is actually, I think, on Doug um, on his um, allocation. I uh, was trying to ask it earlier. I was just trying to figure out with the way they hold back the funds and the allocation for about six months. Um, how is that? How are they going to capture the relevant information in relations to the annual report during the fiscal program year if it kind of goes over to the next? Fiscal year. I'm with this, Doug, can you answer that? I'm still with you. I was just trying to think through that question. So, um, do you mind repeating your question for me? So, so because um, the annual report is having us to all go from, uh, I think it is October 1st to September 30th, and the work that your agencies are doing really allows you to be able able to capture 18 months versus 12 months, correct? Yes. So program, you're saying they program for 12 months, but you won't actually, but they have up to 18 months. How do you, how will you be aligning your, um, because of the process that you do, how will that be aligned to capture it in the annual report? Okay, so I'm going to answer, and if I further use this, then um, um, yeah, we can talk offline, but, but it worked out with our network that their reporting will be on that on the federal fiscal year. So, so this is computing, but they are, when they're submitting their, they sent quarterly reports to me, and the annual report is based on the federal fiscal year. Their reporting is based on the, the program. So when we complete the when I'm doing the annual report, I'm actually yep. getting data that was compiled based on the federal year. Is that a combination of both? Uh, the, could it potentially include both two fiscal years of funding because of the overlap, or not? Yeah, the you know say, two. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jessica. No questions? Oh, we're getting to the end of the day. Oh, wait a minute. Did I just hear someone else wanting to ask a question? Just unmute yourself if you have a question. I know we're getting to the end of the day, so um, I won't hold us further. Feel free to reach out to any of the speakers. And we are very appreciative and glad that all of you were able to join this webinar. And again, uh, we did record this, so if you, you by any chance want to hear this again, or if there's anybody else that wants to listen to this, uh, please feel free to go to the NASCAS uh, website. So, thank you all, and have a good, productive week. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.